This is PodKit, episode 43, React Courage, on Sunday, November 4th, 2018. And now, pop culture web dev nonsense. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rempersat. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk43. Look, I put a corn dog in a 3D environment. Hey guys. Hey. Long time. It's been a moment or two. But not a moment JS. Oh no, that's deprecated. Don't use use that library. No, in this house we love and respect date functions. Oh, they're the best. How's it going? It's pretty good. Going going pretty well. It's been a while since we recorded. It has been. It's been uh, slightly shorter since we've released an episode, though, through the magic of the internet. If and, you if and, you didn't uh, if you couldn't tell, Podkit forty two was actually <laughs> recorded the same day as Podkit forty one back in August, what? and then released like a month later because it took a long time to edit it. Brian, but, are you some sort of like a mystic time being who can time shift things? I yes. can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> All right. Well, the allegation's been made, so just keep an eye out for that. <laughs> well, maybe it hasn't been made because he shifted the time. Oh no! Um, yeah, what? so, so You'll last time we, we tried to record an episode and another episode because that WWDC thing. Wait, no, iPhone thing. Wait, yeah, iPhone thing. That iPhone yep. thing was going along. So we tried to uh, get ahead of it and after it, and we did, but in with some gaps. Um, but you know, since then, new iPhones came out, new iPads came out, new Mac Minis came out, new what's that other MacBook thing? Airs, MacBook Airs, came iPad out. Pros. Um. Yeah, tons of, tons of new stuff came out. Nice. Uh, you should listen to the iOS 12 review Brandon and I did. Uh, the Nexus special on both the iPhone event and the Apple October event. Uh, and I did a macOS Mojave review with Ian. I think that's out too. Yeah. There's a lot of Apple things lately, but now we're back for Podkit, and it's going to be JavaScripty and great. Yep, so uh, basically this is going to turn into React Kit again, so, you know, just brace yourself. <laughs> yes. Uh, I guess kind of our, our big, the big thing we're going to talk about um, c- came out of React Conf, which was on October 25th and 26th, mm-hmm. so like a week ago or so, um, or a week and a half time, whatever that is. Um, but basically the big new thing is React Hooks. So what is that, Ryan? Well, React Hooks, Brian is a new API that will not replace but add to the API surface area of React so that there is an alternative to using classes but with state in React for components. So like a souped-up functional component that's not quite a class. Exactly. So instead of having to make a uh, something extends component, you can just do function some component. So that would be kind of fun. But... What is the API, do you suppose? Like, if you had to dream of a way to do this thing that that actually was made, how would you have made the API for it? Like, I never would have come up with this approach. Um, Yeah, my first first thought, too, was, um, and maybe maybe this is, um, maybe this is kind of a mistake, but my first thought would have been that it would have been, like, a, kind of like a higher order component, more or less. Um... It probably I probably wouldn't call it that because it probably wouldn't be doing quite that same thing, but um, something kind of akin to a function that like you pass an initial state to and that's available to it as a argument or I guess a prop to the component. Right. That's so just it's... how it works today. I mean, you can build that today. That would just be like a, a pattern. There's no real new right API around it. Yeah. So I think it would have been something between one of the new like uh, memo functions, which memoizes yeah. uh, your components by changing um, should component update. But then, as Brandon mentioned, some kind of combination of using a higher order component to control the initial state and maintaining that list of state um, you know, object keys for you. Um, so I think, that, I think that seems like a reasonable alternative to writing your own class pattern. Um, mm-hmm. But that's not what the React team did. They did something a little bit different. Um, and in some ways, they could do this. They can they can use this model because they actually wrote the internals of React, 
Whereas right. I have not, and I don't totally understand how fiber works. I don't understand really any of the internals because I just haven't looked, and there's no good explainer, I guess. Totally. Um, if you do find a good explainer, somebody should link that to us so that we can go and learn how to react kit better. Um, that would be such <laughs> fun follow up if somebody if somebody has that information or can find something like, like that. Some, it fun. must exist somewhere. Somebody must have read through the source code and written an explosively long lengthy post about how it works well it's not a medium so i don't think it exists but hey but but you know what you can do, is listening to this you know what you can know. do with medium you can embed uh <laughs> code sandbox <laughs> there <laughs> <Previews>. we go <laughs> okay well so let's let's talk about a little bit more about what these um hooks are hey you know before we get to talking about how what hooks are and how they work can we comment on the name? Yeah. So who's it's, hooked it, on the name? It's <laughs> it's pretty pretty silly. Yeah. So I think, and, and I don't actually know entirely what they're going for, but when I think about hooks, I think about basically event handlers in a way, right? Right. Um, so you have an application like on a back end. From a back end perspective, you have um, maybe like, user created event and you can make a hook for that so that you can mm-hmm. run arbitrary code and not just once but and many modules could hook into that created user event and then do whatever you need to do um I, i'm wondering if they kind of view this as like less of less of like creating hooks into your component and more about like you're using a hook into the internals of react that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do unless you used the shall we say legacy soon to be legacy not at all legacy uh class interface yeah is that kind of what they're after i I mean i feel like that must be what they're after there's been much discussion um so so dan abramov uh one of the react team members there's been a lot of discussion even by him about the naming and i don't think anybody's totally settled on the naming because it just isn't a good name, but there also isn't a great alternative. Right. Um, so I think at this point, I would almost prefer React, and I and I hate to do that kind of thing, but like, just make up a word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so hook some time. arbitrary word that is placing hooks. React courage. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> the, represents the courage to jettison class components. <laughs> the courage to that's, try to try this out with a new beta, you know, uh, it's not production ready it's API. Yeah, um, yeah so exactly. they, do, they do say TLDR. There are no plans to remove classes from React. Yeah, right? just call back and I mean, call back. I mean, just 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 should update in React eighteen. Um, there you go. <laughs> no callbacks. So um, yeah, so that's important to spell out initially. So like hooks aren't replacing classes in the short term. It's just but an, in order an, to use hooks, you must first replace the class. Yeah. Well, in order to use hooks, you just can't use classes. Right, so, exactly. Right. So it's not a replacement, it's an alternative. Yeah. Um, and so that's cool. Allegedly, everything that you wrote before should still work. Um, so the, the core of how hooks work is instead of writing a class component, you just write a function, and then you use... A, a function f- exported from the React package called useState. Um, and this is the simplest version of this. Mm-hmm. useState is basically a function that takes in an initial state for one property. So in the old days, you would define your state class property, and then maybe it would be an object full of three or four properties or something, right? Mm-hmm. So in my example that I have linked down here, that would be username and password. So that could be just like a user password uh, login form. Well, so in this version, in the hook version, you have a single function called useState that takes in an initial value that could be blank for the username. And that returns an interesting thing um, to a lot of people. But when I saw this, I thought it was like, oh, that makes perfect sense. So what it's doing is it's returning a tuple, or in other words, a two index array Mm -hmm. the first value is the literal value that 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 state represents so the first time it renders that'll be blank but then as you bind it to something it could be your username 
And then the second value is a setter for that first value. So that would be the equivalent of set state, but instead it would be like set username or set password. So in in some ways this becomes more verbose because now you have the value literal and a setter function coming out of every single use state function call. But it's also a little bit more explicit. So instead of having to rely on, you know, weird destructuring tricks, instead of having to redo, um, you know, like a complex nested object in set state, now you can just call set whatever and go directly there. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a, it's hard to explain without seeing the code. So I highly suggest you take a look at the, uh, hook docs here and uh enjoy being confused for a few minutes but i think it helps just to look at the code to get the flavor of what goes on there yeah i remember so when this came out i i spent an hour at work reading through a lot of these docs and um and then on twitter it just started exploding over the next couple of days of people building all these crazy uh uses for hooks Mm -hmm. and i had never really thought of the potential of hooking in that way because you can extend it there's um concepts like use effect which i don't remember off the top of my head what that even is but there's a whole several websites out there that just list ridiculous amounts of hooks that you can implement in your um in your components and so these would kind of replace libraries but specifically for react so mm-hmm. there's even less work you have to do if you want to use some sort of uh, helper library i guess yeah, so use effect is a oh man. The, the word hook is just so bad. Use effect is basically a combination of did mount and did update. Um, right. Okay. So the first time it runs, it's did mount, and then the subsequent times is it's did update. Basically, so it's, an, an effect is something that re-renders whenever um, the state or props change. Right. Well, I guess props because the state isn't it's a functional component, so Well, I mean it's a little it, different. I mean I think it's I mean it's both. I guess if you have other hooks in that component it would probably run your use effect again. Yeah. Okay. Probably. Test test it to find out. I mean it whatever whatever component did update. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um whatever that did, hooks will do similarly. Um now the the so for some reason a lot of people are concerned about use 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 effect because it's obscure um like some of the syntactical not syntactical but like the semantics are a little bit weird so the first time right. it runs it's a, it's a did mount subsequent times it's did update but then if you need to remove if you want to like do a cleanup for your component like on a did unmount you return a function and it'll run that function for you if you want it to only run when some properties, whether that be a prop or a um, state variable change, then you pass in an array as the second argument. I don't know what people are complaining about here. There have been obscure APIs for the last 500 years, I'm pretty sure. So right. this one thing being slightly odd isn't a reason to like say no forever. It's a reason to find a better way to express it. Absolutely. Um, so then in addition to use state, use effect, um, you can build your own custom hooks. Oh, man, I hate the word hooks. I have not done this part yet. And when I tried, I didn't really know what I was doing because I'm just not used to thinking that way yet. And I and I don't totally know when I have, like, just joint state like this so i guess i was just confused with that part of the system right um there's some other really useful default hooks though there's use context which allows you to define a context like normal using the new api and then instead of having to do render props for and and even worse nested render props you can just use context you pass in the context and suddenly you get your context object done that easy um that's wonderful it's hard to believe how wonderful it is um and then finally as a default hook there's also use reducer and because i assume dan works there at facebook and is like hey you know what would be really funny to do let's just delete redux 
<laughs> and build it in. Like, that's cool. Well, I've, no. been, I've been hearing for a while now saying, you know, there's really not much of a reason for Redux anymore. And that was kind of after the context API. Yeah. I think especially People now. who say that don't know what they're talking about. Right. Um, so so one of, one of the uh, – this is a different show um, that will uh, totally be recorded one day. But there's this kind of idea where you exchange simplicity for capability. And so, for example, hooks are – I mean, uh, context is really, really cool because it's just built in and you can do sort of the same thing you could do with Redux, but you can exchange the simplicity relatively of context and you can get Redux and now you're suddenly given, and this is a funny thing, hooks into its system through middleware so you could do much more capable things like logging every state transition. You can persist to local storage instantly and automatically. Those mm-hmm. things you can't do with context, at least not today. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think at the end of all of this hook hook madness, um, you know, a lot of interesting things come out of this. So for me, one interesting thing was I witnessed two Apple events in near term, and the excitement for me about just generally any of this stuff was way higher with hooks than either Apple event. Um, <laughs> so I, mean, I have fair. a lot of... Well, it affects us more day to day. Yeah, I guess because so. Because we work in React. Which is yeah. weird. Um, although having a Mac Mini on my desk will totally be better day to day. But um, True. The, the, hook, the hook thing is interesting. Um, and then I think, I think Dan and others on the core team have wondered, like, why was this such a big deal? Like, what what did we do? And and I don't know how they're not aware of what they did. They they kept a backup proposal from Public Light that um, they then said at a conference at the main stage keynote would disrupt the future potentially of what had been. And so then and so then I guess the question is. Should should JavaScript things should any kind of code things um, merit such attention? Like, w- what if they hadn't gone on stage? What if the hook proposal had just been posted on GitHub, and then Dan just said, "Hey, come and look at this future plan thing, future roadmap thing for React." What do you think? Like, so what do you guys think about that? Was it completely secret? Because I feel like they do have some, they do have an RFCs area on the React GitHub or something. They I, do. I swear I've seen. Um, this particular thing was, I believe, kept back intentionally for the announcement on the conference day. Okay. Some people knew about it, of course. I mean, like Ryan Florence undoubtedly knew about it weeks ahead of time. Yeah. Right. So, like, I've, I think I've said a lot of words in the past possibly on the show, possibly in fringes and possibly on Slack and on Twitter about kind of... So everywhere. So, yeah, on <laughs> all the places everywhere. where I say words. Uh, yeah, about how kind of uh, obnoxious sometimes I find some of the machinations of the what I've sometimes referred to as the React Illuminati. And um, I think a lot of that kind of has to do with stuff like this, the kind of perpetual aw shucks nature that they kind of take towards the, these things that they clearly must know they're doing um, to kind of manipulate the hype around uh, what React is and how React is changing. Um, I, I think, uh, Brandon, I don't know, I, there, I'll never be able to find the thing that I'm looking for, but like f- in February when Suspense came out from Dan's right. previous groundbreaking talk about the life-shattering events of the future... Right. Um, you showed me like this React hype calendar, where yeah. like January uh, something something React, February suspense. Yep. What what will it be in March? Something, you know. Right. Like every every month there has to be some hypey news thing, and I I thought that was funny, and I thought about that immediately when this happened. No, totally, absolutely, and I don't think I could find that again either. Um, probably in part because there have been so many other kind of hypey things about this. Yeah. And I think I, I think you're totally right that this is kind of um Yeah. I I I personally feel it's kind of obnoxious. Like I think I think they're doing technically interesting things. Um but I think there are lots of other 
um, communities we can look to that kind of make this kind of change, ma- this kind of change management a little bit less uh, of like a personality cult sort of thing, or like a um, and 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 kind of just makes it more part of the process. Because like I think as you mentioned, Brian, there is an RFC's repo, but that seems to be kind of directional. It seems to be like a way for people to suggest RFCs. Or a way for certain changes that people feel are kind of don't don't warrant that kind of splashy um, res- uh, reveal um, to go through, and then what you know for the things that do require a, a splashy reveal, those usually um, show up on the internet after the splashy reveal. Um, but you know, t- who am I but a but a backseat observer to most of this stuff? Um, I- I mean, it seems like the the React team is, you know, they're following what Apple and other tech companies have done, where they keep things secret and then drop it and say, "Here it is." And you know, it's it's a little different when it's a product versus a library that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people use every day to do their work. Right. Yeah, and I guess like the other component to it too is like then they have this as kind of as Ryan kind of mentioned other this component. kind of aw shucks. This kind of <laughs> aw shucks nature, like I I don't understand why people are are freaking out over this, and it's like no, you knew exactly what you were doing. Either you knew exactly what you were doing, or you shouldn't really be in charge of something so public facing and impactful to people. I don't know how they didn't expect the reaction. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. But who am I? But some rando. But it's it's kind of annoying to have people apply that stuff to. Um, to something that is so kind of uh, relied upon and maybe we don't often question uh, or examine ha- just kind of how much uh, kind of unnecessary and kind of like personality cult uh, machinations yep. are occurring. Yeah, and I um, so I, I do a lot of tech interviews and one of the questions that I have in my tech interviews is like it's not really a question but it's a pl- it's a place where you fill out how right. aware of this like how aware of historical events current events and future events is this candidate and and i don't i don't really hold it against people if they don't know like what's happening in like pop pop pop, pop culture i don't know web dev nonsense that we partake in like, i gotta right, hold right, it right. against people <laughs> um but i always think like do normal people working for like real like doing real work like so not me i guess um like do normal people who are working in the react industry like actually pay attention to any of this stuff i feel like they might not right like a person might just be using react bootstrap and you know react date picker and making some redux actions and thunk and that's all they do every day all the day uh, I, I guess like the the other thing I had to say about that was just like there's the, and there's like a pretty big gulf too there in like the enthusiasm for React and um, kind of how much you're willing to put up with right. Oh, um, for sure. Like I've I've worked with people who who work with React but are not um, kind of plugged into the, um, the kind of ego component or like the the kind of connected uh, to the ego component. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they, um, yeah, exactly, right? Um, and, and those people sometimes just ask, like, extremely, um, you know, kind of innocent questions about, like, wait, when, when did this change, right? Like, there's a situation right. where we were using old context for a form yep. component, and now new, co- new context is a thing, and now new context is just context, that's what it is. And I was explaining that to, to somebody, and they were like, when Whoa. did this change? Right, and, and I and think why? that's really interesting. Like, how yeah. does, um, how, do, how do regular developers get updates, not like code updates, but like mentality updates in, right. uh, I don't know, what would you call it? Like, what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the human version of a software update? Awareness? Right. I don't know. Right, right, right. But, but how, and how news do... How, and- yeah. Yeah, just conversations with people, I guess. I mean, I feel like a lot of coworkers I have, um, you know, when something new comes out into the React ecosystem, they'll hear about it from me or from someone posting a link in our, like, React channel on Slack or something. 
Right. And, you know, it's, it's you know, through word of mouth and other people kind of... For sure. Totally. About it. I mean, it's just how we we hear about it, too. It's just we're hearing about it from the library maintainers themselves. Yeah. Right. And so just one more chain down the line. I feel and bad I guess, for like, being one of those, um, I don't know, telephone repeater people. Right. But that's been my whole life, so... No, totally. And I was just going to say, too, like, um, that's kind of a thing that I've... Uh, found as well and tried to at- intentionally discourage myself from doing um at work is like hey like uh w- I, f- I feel like people should be able to use the technology without having to be um kind of an acolyte for the high priests of react right um i i don't i don't think you need to i i i feel like in, I, I feel like people should be able to be productive without having to constantly have those updates and constantly have to have to know everything about the history of uh, uh, of React um, or right. even just basic basic things like being able to determine whether or not this Stack Overflow thing or you know or, or even like this library um, it has information that's up to date or is still useful. Um, now these are problems that have existed for a long time, but I think that because React operates on this, like, well, you know about it because you follow Dan Abramov and Ryan Florence and the everyone on the React core team. That's how that's how I know what I need to do now, right? Like that's that's kind of bad. I feel like, <laughs> right? And and I agree with that to most extents, but I also think like there's also like an advancement gulf because. Yep. There's there from Ryan Florence and Kent and, and and even Dan. There's like this huge focus on like beginner work, but right. then as soon as you want to do something somewhat slightly novel with your React code, you right. don't really get to go to them anymore. And then they come back to talk to you once you start writing basically internals, but on the outside somehow. Right. Um. So I think it's weird. There's like multiple gulfs of attention and awareness between the community and those people and us it, it's a really interesting like sociological or, or socio-psychological thing and I've, i'm kind of it, it would be interesting to see if anyone's studying stuff like this i know i know of a couple people at the u who were who were doing things like this about like the um studying the sociological and psychological attributes of of communities of programmers um, but I haven't talked to them in a while, so maybe I should see what they're up to because that would be really interesting. That would be very interesting. I, I hope somebody gets enough time to study this because it won't mm-hmm. last. Until, oh wait, nope. Next month something else will change. <laughs> right. They should come do a talk at JavaScript Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, t- to be honest, I've kind of been ever so slightly trying to draft a, a talk about this, but I'm trying to do it in a way that won't Ooh. get me permanently banned from. Uh, react dumb every community right right right. i think i think what what did i call it like uh uh the react illuminati must be stopped and 10 other javascript heresies or something like that that's uh, amazing yeah yeah so uh we'll, we'll see if i can tone it down a little bit and pitch it to somebody <laughs> nine <laughs> yeah right from 10 to nine yep. yeah so i think i think we'll be talking more about hooks over time as we get to use them I mean, they're not even in beta yet. They're literally in alpha. Right. Um, and they might not, like, the next version of Hooks might be actually be called something, like, useful and meaningful, uh, whereas what they are right now is not. Um, so you can um, click on some of our links to learn more about Hooks. There's the docs. Um, Egghead.io has a great free course from Kent, who talks about this for about 10 minutes. Um different different uh different joke in there somewhere and then of yep. course you can also look at um one of my little react hook playgrounds just to see what it looks like yeah nice. i'm curious what libraries kind of develop out of these because there's a bunch of like sandbox trial things here but what's you know once once this is released what is gonna what's how is the ecosystem going to change right because react is good about not breaking backwards compatibility so if you don't want to use it you don't have to but what new libraries or patterns are going to come out? Like, will there be a huge push now to say, okay, we're not using Redux anymore or never use class components? Is there going to be a shift like that, do you think? Yeah, I think I think the cl- class component one could happen only if and when hooks become part of a stable version. But until right. then, no. Yeah. But, like, the thing with Redux, and again, this is a talk for another time, 
but Redux is not going away anytime soon. There's a reason for its existence, and hooks and context don't mitigate it. Well, we followed that thread through hook, line, and sinker, right? Eh? Oh my gosh! <laughs> had, had to work that in. Had to had to work that in. Uh, so now, in lieu of a actual segue, let's talk about some new uh, Apple products we bought. I love Apple products. Hey, I've been known to buy them from time to time. Did you Me buy too. a new Apple product, Just Brandon? I sure did. Um, it was probably right after we recorded the last podcast too. So I got a new uh, 15 inch. Early 2018, mid 2018, I think mid it's 20, mid. mid 2018 MacBook Pro. Woohoo! Yeah, congrats. I've, is, I've, is this the one you bought in Seattle on a trip? In Portland, yeah, for sure. Oh, Portland, yeah, um, yeah, um, which is which is kind of cool because uh, you know Portland's cool. So what um, happened to the old one? Did its keyboard die, or did it what what happened to it? That's a good question. So um, listeners may recall that I got a used MacBook in July. So uh, and it had a, it had a nice two week lifespan um, <laughs> and, until I realized that there was a graphics card issue that was causing it to Melt. kernel panic whenever I launched the iOS simulator or Ouch. anything that really used the GPU whatsoever, even if it was like WebGL demos. And it's pretty. It seems like it's still pretty infrequent. Was that one that had a discrete GPU? It was why. one that had a discrete GPU yeah, okay, so. and a uh, NVIDIA discrete GPU. So Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, gotta watch out for that. So that buddy is en route to the uh, refurbishment center. Um, Were and... you able to, to trade it in for some value? Because I know Apple's been doing more of that these yep. days. Yeah. I, nice. I think I'm going to get um, basically my purchase price back. So that's good. That's um, good. Nice. Yeah, and then I'll maybe... We'll, we'll we'll see what happens there, um, but uh, it kind it was kind of poor timing because uh, I was in Portland. Um, I had some kind of computing stuff I needed to do at the time, both for work and kind of for the conference. Um, so I just kind of um, uh, looked up where the nearest Apple store was, and it turned out it was right across the street from where I was staying. So I perfect. Uh, just whipped around the corner. Uh, I got a new MacBook, and the dude at the Apple store was like, are you, are you sure you know what you want already? And I'm like, yes, I'm just looking for the quickest possible way for me to get back up and running. And he was like, cool, uh, swipe your credit card here, buddy. And uh, <laughs> sure Were you enough, in and out in like 10 minutes? I basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was... I've, I've done that before, too, where I'm like, I know exactly what I want. I just go in and go out. And they're like, but they're, I feel like by the time I'm leaving, they're like, what just happened? Because... Yeah. There's, they'd have zero work. They just have to facilitate the transaction, yeah. and yeah. that's all. Yep. But, yeah, it was pretty sweet. Just hopped back to the hotel, uh, unwrapped everything, took a couple pictures of the box so that I knew I had my serial number and whatnot, recycled the box. and oh, then wow. uh, That was quick. Yeah. And nice. Yeah, because I can't, can't bring it back with me. Or I could, but why would I? Um, and... Uh, and got up and running. Went to the Mozilla VR meetup. It was pretty uh, pretty sweet. Sketched out some fun little snap lenses that haven't seen the light of day, but it was fun. And got back up and running. Sent all the emails I needed to. Got all the stuff pushed that I needed to. And was able to get back to the conference. So that was fun. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I got the iPhone XS Max in Space Gray. 256 gigabyte. Costs an arm and a leg. And now I'm running with a Qi charger as well. It's really nice. It's fast. The camera's really great. I tested it out. I was in uh, Colorado, what, two weeks ago-ish um, with some family and friends. Nice. Um, so got some nice photos in the mountains. So lots of like light and dark areas in the same photo and, or in the same frame. And it was handling it better than any other phone that I've used. So, so yeah, good. you can hear about that in the uh, iPhone XS review on Second Opinion. And I have a blog post as well about it on my website, brianm.me. So you you didn't have a ten, right? No, I had it the seven. Okay. Yeah, you know I have a, uh, so I I have not purchased any products um, yet. Um, as soon as next week happens, when the um, you know mini Mac Mini comes out and the new iPads nice. come out, um, like in a store, for example, there might be some purchasing that goes on there. Um, but I also feel like you know. We just need to see, uh, like, all of those products are good, 
Like I'm sure the iPad's great, but we need to we need to know like the the real performance of those Mac Minis. Like I'm sure it's fine, but I just got to know. Right, for sure. I will say the Geekbench scores that I've seen look pretty good. Yeah, They're still you know high four thousands for single core and yeah, like performance wise that's fine. But I mean like, um, can it drive three monitors and not explode? Oh. Can it like actually run for more than a day before it's uh, internal keyboard gets dusty mm-hmm. right do, do you need to put it in a freezer in order for it to meet max uh capability yeah exactly so and um yes by the way mac minis totally have an internal keyboard totally so <laughs> so i i guess i'm 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 totally gonna get one probably nice woot woot and uh i i've not bought a mac unfortunately i would have loved to have uh, had an iMac pending right now, but not yet. Someday. Yeah, I, I have to decide what I want to do between iMac, a MacBook, like, 12-inch, and or a MacBook Pro. Like, Just just get one get? from each part of the lineup, and then you'll have, you'll be covered. Right? Oh, that's like, it's like $10,000. Yes, it is $10,000, but you'll be covered. It's a little more than I'd like to spend. And that that's even better, because that way your upgrade cycle will be just as long as Apple's upgrade cycle. There you go. <laughs> but I feel like it, it'd be kind of nice to stagger it a little bit so you're, you're I can right. like keep one over the other. But at this point, I'm running on a over six-year-old MacBook Pro, and I, it's just in desperate need of upgrading. Oh, well, I'll keep tweeting about it. The same conversation over and over as I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I as well. <laughs> well, hey, I have kind of a, a weird pivot. Um, I got a VR headset recently. Nice. Um, yeah, the Oculus Go. Um, I got it because, um, actually, as part of the Oculus keynote, there were some kind of intriguing things about a new headset that they were releasing called the Oculus Quest, which isn't out yet. It'll be out, like, next year sometime. Um, but I was kind of... Um, looking into stuff and thinking about like where my 3d authoring and, 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 um, like 3d, uh, development skills were at and trying to think of a a good way to help me level those up. And I was like, Hey, look, there's a relatively inexpensive ish headset that I can use to kind of figure out what those interactions are like, figure out what, what the kind of level of effort it is, is to build something like that and to put, or to put something in that environment. Um, and so I, uh, I, I got the thing. Um, the interesting thing about the Oculus Go headset though, is that like most of the experiences for it are basically, um, well, so I guess backing up a little bit, um, the Oculus Go is basically a, uh, a headset that has the internals of an Android phone, but no actual phone component. Like you might've heard about or seen the Galaxy what is it, Gear VR, Samsung Gear VR headset, where you actually put a physical Android phone, a a Samsung phone, into the headset, and then you put on the headset, and then your phone is, like, powering the VR uh, experience. Um, This is kind of like that, except the phone is actually built into the headset, so there's no, like, compartment or anything like that. Um, Yeah, and the optics are, are fine, like, they're acceptable, um, it's pretty actually, it's actually moderately comfortable to wear, but the interesting thing is like a lot of the experiences for it, a lot of the games and videos and stuff are actually basically Android apps or are written as Android apps. Um, but are authored particularly to be 3d content. So it's, it's kind of a intriguing and weird, weird place because like a, a lot of the stuff for VR that I've seen so far is like, um, you know, kind of built for the for the rift or built for the Vive. Yep. Um, but um, and as a result, it's not really like a mobile app kind of experience or a mobile app kind of paradigm. But you do kind of get a, the distinct sense that what you're running is Android uh, when you're using that mm. device, which is kind of interesting. Um, yeah. What's what's the performance like on it? Like, is it? How does it compare to... So I've used the Vive. That's the only one. Yeah. So I've, I've also used the Vive. I haven't used a Rift. Um, but it's definitely... Uh, I, I would say it's probably a little bit lower resolution than a Rift. 
um, but not super noticeably so. Um, and I guess I was using like an original, uh, an original Vive, and not like the Vive Pro or anything, or any of the new, newfangled Vive stuff that's come out. Yeah. Um, but it's it's definitely lower resolution. I haven't had any like frame rate issues or anything like that, so that's kind of speaks to it a little bit. But it's um, it's definitely a little little fuzzier. But all of the same kind of head tracking stuff is pretty much on par with what I've seen um, as, as far as the three degrees of freedom stuff goes. So um, you can turn your head left or right, up or down, um, and uh, back and forth. But you can't actually um, you can't actually move around with it. Moving around doesn't do anything. Like standing. Standing up doesn't really change anything, I guess, is what I'm trying yeah, to say. Oh, so it's it's limited to what the headset can track. It's not like you in 3D space. Exactly. Yep. Okay, gotcha. So it's like it's like a better Google Cardboard? Yeah, I'd definitely say it's probably more akin to that than like a scaled-down Rift or Vive. Gotcha. Okay. But as, as far as the fidelity of the content, the content's pretty solid. Yeah. Um, yeah, like mo- most of the difficult math seems to be... In like tracking your position in the 3D world, which this doesn't do, so um, it's not sending all that fun stuff off to the to to somebody's super fancy graphics card. It's all just a mobile phone chipset. But yeah, it's just you know, it's just like panning a camera and rendering at a higher resolution. Yep. Pretty much exactly. Um, yeah. I, I put some links in the show notes of like good th- things that I think were done really well. But I guess like the mo- the more interesting thing, I guess like you can. You can do like Google Street View, which I've used sometimes where you can just like give it a location and it'll use Street View to render a 360 degree view that kind of, of that an experience point. is awesome. I've done the Google Earth and the Vive and it's like, it's incredible. You're just like flying around the world. Yeah. It's so much fun. Mm-hmm. And it's like one of those things too, where like you don't really need six degrees of freedom for that to be awesome. You don't need to be able to stand up and move around in that world for it to be awesome. It can be awesome just to stay where you are and like kind of. Uh, use that same sort of like portally interaction to move you from one place to the next, and it can still be super cool. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's definitely probably like the number one thing. There are also some really fun games for it. I just put some links to the show notes uh, for that. But um, one of the big reasons I got this was to take a look at how web VR would work. So there's a, a framework called A Frame that I've been messing around with a little bit to build web VR experiences to put 3D objects in a VR world, stuff like that. And it's, like, fine, but most of the web VR experiences I've seen are, A, pretty on Rails, so, like, you don't really have any controls. Or if you do have controls, the controls aren't really mapped very well for the Oculus Go. So um, that's kind of a a thing I need to figure out. But it's, so far, pretty fancy. Pretty fancy, pretty fun stuff. It's interesting to see all the, like, UI and UX decisions people are making around, like, how to how to use 3D... How to use like um, the Oculus Go remote and other sorts of like positional sorts of things, accelerometer based things to control stuff. Um, but I don't think we've figured that out yet. I don't think anyone's really figured that out yet. There are people with ideas, but I don't think it's. I don't think it's fully fleshed out. So, so how how many like how long do you think it'll take for? that to get flushed out we we had a kind of like a, an exploratory project uh, last year at work about this kind of stuff and yeah we kind of determined like yeah well we could we could try to like figure it out but the industry won't pick what we pick and we won't figure it out as fast as somebody else so maybe we should just wait on this for a little while yeah totally i, th- I think it'll take some time and i think it's also very much being driven by um by game developers, mm-hmm. right? Um, which is interesting because I'm not one of those, right? For sure, and <laughs> right? we, like we we are so not game developers. We we were totally using it for industrial applications and you know stuff like that. Totally, and I think there's stuff there's stuff to be learned um, from like industrial uh, industrial needs, right? As as the stuff is is being sorted out, but I definitely feel like a lot of the controls in particular and like this idea of like sp- like spatial ui that is definitely not coming from that side right, right. um i i guess how long do i think it'll take um it's kind of hard to estimate but um i th- i think you know 
the there are already some things that are kind of um, seem to be de facto standards. The kind of ray casting point interface with those remotes, where you like, where the interface kind of draws a line between the controller and you know extends it out as far as it can in 3D space, and if it intersects with something, that's the thing that's like hovered or selected or highlighted or yep. given focus. Um, and that's that's kind of interesting. Um, and I think that that part will stick around. But as far as like how you move things, stuff like that, I think I think there are some ideas and there are some interesting things. But I don't I don't know if like that kind of complex multi tiered interaction is really settled on, and I don't think it will be for probably multiple years in the future. I don't yeah. I don't think that advancement has really come very far, even since since the like Rift dev kit. Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. Um, I think I think you know I, I, last year I said. You know, by 2020, maybe we'll we'll make a dent in that. But at this point, you know, almost to the end of 2018, yeah. I don't think that I don't even think that time scale is right. I'm thinking maybe in 2025, at the time we actually have sort of an industry standard. Um, like if we could get to the point where we were with HTML tables, yeah. Like, like I feel like that's the first step, and we're not even there yet. Right. Definitely I agreed. Like- I feel like the timeline for VR and self-driving cars are kind of along the same line, you know, for, like, wide adoption. Though self-driving cars is probably more difficult. I yeah. don't know. Well, it's just, it just new paradigms that there's a lot of hype around. Yeah, and, and I think, I think, I think self-driving be, cars be might be worse because I don't plan on really programming a self-driving car. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a much more targeted yeah. thing for people who are implementing it. But I think that will have a, a, more, a, a greater impact on the world. For sure. Well, VR is a very different experience for in interacting with um, a, a virtual world or a computer or anything. Mm-hmm. Totally. And I guess like a, another component of it too is like, I, I, I say that the Oculus Go is, is, is like relatively inexpensive. I think it was still like 175 bucks, something like that, which like is, it's like, that's not really inexpensive. It's like inexpensive if you compare it to like uh, what, VR headsets are usually going for out in the world. Like even if you go to like the the least expensive six degrees of freedom thing, which I think is the PlayStation VR, you still have to get a PlayStation in order to make that work. So you're st- looking at like six hundred plus dollars, right? Um, yeah, and I think that's 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 a lot for someone. Or even even the the Oculus Go, when there are cardboard things, people can use their phone. Right. That's what's going to be popular. I mean, it really hasn't been. It has to, you know, this, this, that kind of stuff has to be shipped with a smartphone mm-hmm. for free for it to be hit a wide adoption, unless there's some super compelling reason to use it. Right, and I, th- I also, I'm, I'm kind of with you, and I think that I don't think that there's really, a, I don't, I don't think that we have really a compelling reason right now. I think it's mostly still like in the early, early, early adopter stage. Um, I think most of the ways that people are going to experience VR experiences is when somebody has like a station for it. When it's like in like at a, you know, this is kind of silly, but like if it's at a trade show or the state fair or something like that, yeah, and it's yeah. like yeah. here, put on this VR headset and see. Look, I put a I put a corn dog in a 3D environment, and look, <laughs> you can you can pretend like you're eating a corn dog. Isn't that fun? Um, it's going to be kind of stuff like that which is still cool and like that's probably going to be most of what i author with this stuff is is kind of um you know uh to use a positive term experimental to use a perhaps negative term gimmicky stuff right um and i think that that's mostly because that's kind of where the industry is at right now or where where kind of our um yeah so there's a museum in in denmark i um Zooming in on the map to try to figure out what it's called. Um, it's a, like a harbor museum yeah. or something. But uh, they had two uh, Oculus Rifts dev kit, too, I think, there. Now, this was in 2015. Yep. Um, just like in a museum, you could put them on and look around at this environment. I think it was like a ship in the water, and it was kind of rainy and stuff. Sure. It seemed very gimmicky, but it was just there as an like, installation, try it out kind of a thing. Yep. I think that's kind of where we're headed, for sure. At least for the time being. Yeah. Well, I think that might be an indication that it's time for us to talk through everyone's favorite segment, our new Twitter followees. Woohoo. 
Let's see. So for me, uh, my first new Twitter followee this, this episode. Is, this is one out of 600, right? Yeah, yeah, one, one out of 600 um, is uh, Alvaro Videla, who is uh, an organizer of uh, Durosnokov in uh, Uruguay. Uh, he is a software engineer um, who's written some books and um, is seems like an all-around cool person. Um, and he wrote a post on, uh, kind of, uh, how, uh, urban planning, uh, kind of decisions and comparative urban planning across different societies, um, as kind of used as a barometer for civilization and kind of what that has to do with kind of similar ideas around um recursion and programming that is really good and whenever somebody starts talking about stuff like that i'm like yes mash that follow button uh (laughs) mash the retweet button so it's definitely definitely um worth following too uh my next twitter followee is uh jillian c york who is also known as chillian j yikes um (laughs) uh, on account of the halloween stuff uh she's involved with uh the EFF and some other things. And it's just generally a a cool person to follow for things related to privacy and the internet. Um, and then last but not least is, uh, Melinda golden, uh, at Melinda golden on Twitter. Uh, sorry, Melinda M golden, uh, who's a front end developer. Um, I think we were talking on Twitter about, um, Oh my goodness. I lost track. Some sort of a react thing. <laughs> Could have been forms. I think it was forms. Uh, but they're also a cool person. Uh, and that concludes my list of new Twitter followees that I wish to feature this episode. Nice. I, uh, threw a wrench in the bucket and I have seven accounts. Brandon mode. I'll go through them quick. <laughs> All right. Fake Unicode. Uh, Tweets lots of Unicode bugs and things and conversations. Um, they do a great job of just finding... If you tweet something about Unicode, they'll reply back about it later. So they have a lot of search searches that come up and pull up tweets. That, anything people are talking about Unicode things. Usually the bad parts or <laughs> bugs, quirks. It's a good account. We've all been there. Yes. Uh, the next one is uh, Rebecca Slatkin. Uh, she's an iOS developer person. I don't know. I've seen her tweets retweeted a bit. And apparently 39 followers I have, or I follow, also follow her. So if that says anything. Nice. Good account to follow. She has a nice dog. Uh, yeah. They're all good dogs, Ryan. It's cute. Next is uh, Luke Schlangen. He's uh, here in Minneapolis. He's one of the leaders at Prime Academy. He did a talk at JSMN like a month ago. That was pretty good. So I followed him. Uh, next is, uh, Yolanda Smith. She gave a talk at NodeMN about building secure, um, web applications. Those quite good. Uh, I think she works at a large company here in the Twin Cities. Nice. Uh, let's see who's next. Uh, Sophie Bits or Sophie Alpert, who's the manager of the React team at Facebook. And I think she worked on React much earlier um, in its life. Uh, and finally, uh, Randall Meeker, who is of the local Minneapolis JavaScript and tech community. Woo. Brandon knows him too. Randall is a good kid. That's all folks for me. Cool. How about well, you, Ryan? I did follow new people. So hey, you can enjoy this one rare time event. Uh, so let's see here. Um, I followed um, Ahmed Awaz. I'm not sure exactly how to say his name, but that's okay. Um, he recently went to some kind of talk somewhere. Um, what is the conference here? Uh, I don't know. He went to a conference, and I saw his slides for this stuff, and I thought they were really cool. Um, yeah, it was um, the Open DevCon Conf. And nice. what a What a name, right? Um, and so the slides for the talk that he gave there was uh, 
pretty cool. Like um, they were very interactive slides, I guess you might say. Sweet. Um, so they, the, that was part of the keynote, and and it was ch- talking a part of the, the what the new hipsters called the jam stack, which is not my favorite terminology, but that's okay. Hmm. Is it is it uh, JavaScript, Angular, and MongoDB? No. <laughs> Java and MooTools? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Uh, jQuery, um, Atlassian, and um, oh goodness gracious, MuleSoft. No, <laughs> no, none of those. It actually stands for JavaScript, APIs, and Markup. These are all different. Huh. Th- what? That's not a stack. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't like it. Goodness but, gracious. But but either way, it's still cool. And so the talk goes into more depth about. Um, some of that stuff that we don't know about. Right. Um, but just think Gatsby if you're curious. Oh. Um, so then a few weeks ago, Jira uh, is a product from Atlassian. Part of they the Jamstack? Big... No, it is not Jamstack. It's, I think it's pretty close to the opposite. Oh, my goodness. That that was the thing. That was that... the joke I should have made. Jira, Atlassian, and what's an Atlassian product that starts with N? There's got to be one. I'm sure there is one, but I don't know. All right. Back Migrating to Migrating from GitHub. <laughs> oh. Um, and so uh, Jira had their big redesign recently, and so I commented on the redesign, and um, Jake Barrington uh, mm-hmm. tweeted at me, and so I followed him back, and uh, I thought that was pretty cool. So, uh, yeah. And then finally here we have a person named Kevin Hoffman, who I might have talked about before i don't know um but this person um does a lot of cool stuff with go rust elixir and WebAssembly, um and i probably followed them because they were talking about rust at some point nice Um, even though they have that awful go go for um yeah every once in a while i hear people talking about GopherCon, and i'm like when will GopherCon be in minnesota <laughs> That's that would the make true sense, right? origin of Gopher, right? You know? Like you can't, you can't just, yeah, yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, this was fun. Yeah, we should uh, do another of these. Yeah, you know, before the new year. Before the new year. Let's well, maybe even two. Maybe even we'll two. see if we can even. We'll, do we'll that. see what we can do. No we promises. Will. No promises at all. So where can we I find you? At least one more. Where, where can we find you on the internet, Brandon? Since you probably are somewhere new. <sighs> Yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm all sorts of places, but I guess the most uh, the most important one you can find me at is at Brandon MN Brandon underscore MN on Twitter, or my new website, which is Brandon in the dot cloud. Um, I'll probably redirect Brandon dot MN there, or make Brandon dot MN a C name of Brandon in the dot cloud or something like that. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure out what that looks like, but um, it's just a fun new website that. Uh, it says more words about me now that I'm uh, a freelancer. Nice. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll be around. Find me at the coffee shops in Minneapolis. I'll be at all of them simultaneously. A super imposition. I mean, yeah, you, you should do you, a, a write up right. of what are the best environments to do work at for coffee shops in the Twin Cities. Yeah, I'll have to do some scientific trials and see where it goes. I've been trying to go to all the coffee shops in Uptown just to work for a few hours. And I only have a few left, I think. Have you been to Misfit yet? Where is that one? Lindale uh, and 30 something. Uh, maybe. Yeah. I'll have to look it up on a map. Yeah, I know. I, I just I'll well, just give you a very precise address, so I, I don't know. Messing with you. <laughs> the th- I, I have no idea where it is. But it's on Lindale and some street on the thirtieth block. Uh but we should we should meet up there sometime. Misfit's cool. They're good. There's folks. one on twenty fourth and Lindale. Oh, yeah, I guess it's less uptowny than I thought. That's the I one. I have not though. been to that one. There's also a Misfit Coffee, like downtown or near the river. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's the food Guthrie truck. Guthrie Theater. Oh, okay. Or coffee truck. Yeah. Yeah. It tells me Guthrie Theater. That's, that's not Misfit Coffee. Yep. It, they usually park right outside of the Guthrie. That's how I found them. Nice. They're good kids. Nice. Uh, well, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or on my website, brianm.me. Or around in Uptown. Doing cool stuff. What about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ranwire, and of course on my website, ryanrampersad.com. Well, you can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk43. 
Uh, we also have a subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV, where you can comment and discuss this episode and all of the other episodes on the Nexus. And finally, we have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the Nexus TV, if you're feeling like uh, giving us some support for all the podcasts that we do. Yeah, you should totally do that. It's good for you. Definitely. Patreon a day keeps the uh, podcasts online. There you go. <laughs> That's what that's what I always say. That's I think Definitely. that's true. Copyright 2018, Brandon Johnson. <laughs> In the cloud. In the cloud. <laughs> well, with that. Okay, well this is yeah. great. Well, have a good one until next time. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.